Hello dear viewers, welcome to my channel Science Show Technology. In today's show, Science Thursday, we're going to talk about ultra high bypass turbofan jet engine. So let's dive right into it. So before we understand ultra bypass turbofan, we have to understand what exactly is a jet engine. Jet engine is what we call as air breathing reaction engine, meaning it throws stuff out of the back. That's how it can push. Action equals reaction. Basically, it's exactly like a rocket engine. That's why this and rocket engine are measured in exactly same units. So this is air breathing. This just cannot go in vacuum. That's the whole difference between that. Now, how the heck it's getting that push? Well, it's fast moving jet of heated gas, meaning it pumps a lot of heat into a medium, generally air. Air heats up, it goes out of that, becomes a jet that pushes it forward. How all of this is accomplished? Well, you start with a, what we call compression stage, meaning you take air in and you compress this puppy. And you can notice that air intake volume here would be high and then it starts to go smaller and smaller and smaller. Now again, in real world engine, it would be very different, but you get the point. Like it's always like large input, you make it small and you have axial compressor. Now axial compressors are generally far more, what you call inline. There is no stoppage, there is no pulse, there is no tick, 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 no, it's continuous. So that's how you create compressed air. Now benefit of compressed air, you can add lot of high density fuels there. For example, JP1, jet propellant 1, basically a refined version of kerosene and you can burn that puppy. Now you have dumped a lot of uh, chemical energy, now it has been converted into thermal energy. Now thermal energy wants to go out, again thermal pressure, it wants to go out. That heated jet spins what we call uh, basically turbine. Now the turbine is on the same shaft as the compressor. So turbine spins, spins the compressor. Compressor creates more air, you put more fuel, voila. That's how it's a self-fulfilling cycle. Meaning you've put fuel in, everything works continuously. And then the remainder exhaust goes out of the back and that pushes your plane. That's how it works. And it's same in everything, meaning it is a jet, jumbo jet or fighter jet does not matter. It's same logic. You have air, you compress that puppy, you put fuel in and you have exhaust out of it. That's how we created jet engine technology. Now there was a problem with jet engine that is we call it has poor coupling efficiency, meaning you are creating a lot of hot gas. Awesome. Those hot gases are very high velocity. It could be even Mach 2 velocity. Awesome. But here's the your plane is not going that fast, meaning the energy that you are expelling outwards is not directly coupling to you very well. So people figured out very early on is that to couple it far more efficiently, meaning we are getting X amount of energy from the fuel, we want X amount of energy transferred to our aircraft, not just going into the back of the air, making things hot. We don't want that. We want transfer of that energy. So large diameter, slow rotating fan. If we can have a giant fan in front that is moving a lot more air, basically it's extracting heat and pressure energy from the exhaust spin a giant as fan which moves a lot of air slowly but moves a lot of air that gives far better forward momentum because we might feel this is a reaction engine so everything is about how much you can throw now throwing something very fast is desirable again if you want to travel at Mach 3 or something like that yeah that's desirable but in normal scenario like basically subsonic aircraft the coupling efficiency becomes a very big hassle so for that reason, people figured out big ass fan on front that moves a lot of air and it extracts a lot of energy from the core. Basically, the exhaust stream is leaching a lot of thermal energy from that, which directly leads it to being cooler. Now, if you have that huge ass fan, how the heck you manage air? You create a duct around it. Now, this duct also allows you to have efficiency and cooling air. This is the reason why cores don't overheat. That fan is also acting as a like basically cooling fan for the uh, jet engine basically how the heck you have tiny uh, what we call drone motors not overheating because it has giant cooling fan same is happening here so that's how we get that now sp energy for uh, spinning that big ass fan is directly comes from the jet and here's the benefit part it increases your useful thrust meaning how much thrust you are actually getting coupled to your chassis and it also makes it quieter. It's like, how the heck it's making quieter? Well, there are two things happening. First, you are leaching more energy off. So let's say X amount of energy was there if you had no fan structure there. Now you have a fan structure, you are leaching a lot of energy to drive this fan. Again, pressure goes down, temperature goes down. Inherently, you have less energy to make a noise, okay? Then you have the core exhaust. It's now surrounded by cooler, fast moving air. So you have very fast moving air in the center, you have fast moving air, and then you have the ambient. Because now there's like this noisy air, it has a curtain of slightly less uh, noisy air, is everything is buffered. So sounds of modern jet engines is 
bafflingly quiet like uh, most of us who unless who like in their 30s we do not know what is the noise level of uh, jet engines were because majority of the planes that we use now or even for last 20 30 years they all of them have been transitioned to turbofan like again that transition happened very early on people figured out very early on and planes back in the days black and white era when planes used to go over stadium people used to stop talking why you could not hear anything that's how loud they were airports were brutal like fundamentally it was on a whole different level right now the noise that you hear when you're in airport building is primary from the apus not from the jet engine so you have to be mindful because once we figured out that high pass bypass duct we made very quiet engines so and the higher the bypass ratio, the better the fuel efficiency, meaning how much propellant you have to burn in order to get from A to B, that goes down drastically because you're coupling it. Basically, energy is the same. It's just that instead of throwing, wasting it away, you are like, hey, what if we use it? So that's much better. And back in the days when we figured it out, we started as low as like 2.6. What does that mean? That simply means if one is going from the core, 2.6 is going from the ducts. Now, nowadays, again, uh, we have scaled that puppy up to 11, meaning if one goes there, 11 goes out there so very efficient now be mindful does not mean every engine is at 11 because again there is other things known as economics meaning if you are making a regional jet that's not that viable again you still need a, uh, what we call turbo fan in order for mileage but you won't be like let's make a giga chad fan you want to be like let's, let's be realistic here and that's the reason and why the heck jumbo jets that are designed to go cross continent have to have that huge again they will not be able to go there because they're gonna run out of fuel mid-air if they do not have the highest efficiency engine possible so that's why and our aim how huge we can go is generally 20 to 1 that's the point where we really want to be right now we have reached the halfway and 20 to 1 would be the most optimum that we can achieve given the laws of physics given the laws of mechanical thermodynamics and all that efficiency and inefficiencies 20 to 1 is supposed to be the ideal ratio where it's like this is the most optimum and more is always better we always want more 11 i can guarantee you the moment people reached 11 they are like okay now let's work for 12 we want as high as possible this is turbofan but turbofan has an issue now there are two things two factors working on uh, basically inside the engine that is rpm and aerodynamics now these two things are at conflict they are not marrying together properly they are not making love to each other so what does that mean that simply means if you have a fan which has large diameter which you want for high bypass does not like high rpm anything that goes large generally starts to go down in rpm fundamentally that's why like if you have very large wind turbine you'll always notice the fans are slow rotating very slowly same goes here now why the heck uh, not like why the heck you can't just build it better and stronger and all that jazz to spin super fast well if they spin super fast their tips will reach a point where they are crossing supersonic speed basically uh, sonic speed meaning they will create shock waves and sound barriers they will break that meaning you are wasting a lot of energy meaning you are creating what you call dirty air meaning it's just noisy as hell and you are wasting energy rather than actually moving forward uh, for example this is a soviet union's uh, bomber that they did that and this puppy was so loud and that people around it basically fighter jet that are fly in formation they could not do it for long because this was that loud and be mindful this is flying at altitude and tips are that noisy that at that low atmospheric pressure the noise can go from a to b and person in the b would be like i cannot bear this so that's how brutal it was like it was actually used to fly if they are detecting there's supposed to be a submarine they will fly on top of it submarine headphones are like boom that's how bad this was so you do not want tip to go supersonic it has like brutal side effect not only on other things around you also on you that's why this plane is not known as like the latest and greatest so fundamentally there are laws that you're like da shall not cross supersonic tip speed so and there is come the another aspect of thermal engines thermal engines are like okay uh, your outdoor temperature let's say you are in india outdoor temperature is 50 degrees celsius okay cool how much heat do you want on your core well high, as high as possible the higher the heat in the core versus the basically outdoor the more efficient your engine will be which we call temperature delta t delta basically you want outdoor the gap the wider the gap the better it will be let's say outdoor is 10 degrees celsius and you are burning 600 degrees celsius you're gonna get a lot of energy now let's say outside is 50 degrees but you are burning at 900 degrees celsius you're gonna get even more energy you want that delta to be as wide as possible now how the heck that delta will translate into energy well it will increase your rpm 
what the heck is it like your engine is limited you have a spinning mass how the heck uh, you know it's gonna couple the energy again okay? if you add more fuel more hot gases more turbine rpm turbine spins faster so your turbine the inside in the engine could reach point where it's like i want to go as high as 20000 rpm and the fan is like bro do not cross 5000 rpm at that diameter is like that's too much so these two things are the problem they are not making love to each other Core needs to be hot for efficiency, which if it tries to be at hot, it directly ends up le in leading a point where it has very high RPM, which fan hates it. So that's the issue. Now you're like, why can't we do this or that? Here's the deal. You can do everything on land. The moment you think about doing anything on aircraft, you have to deal with two factors. First is weight. Second factor is reliability. Not only it has to be light, otherwise it will simply not take off the ground, but it also has to be reliable. While many times we feel like airplanes are like, you know, tin boxes, that's surprisingly robust. The idea with that is like uh, planes should survive one or two maintenance check failure. At least that much. At least that much. That's what that's expected out of it. It's like if jet engine is not maintained, at least one uh, flight or two flight it should do without going boom. And if you're maintaining it properly, nothing bad should happen. So that's why you have to be very mindful of the weight and you have to be very mindful of the reliability, meaning you cannot put a hyper complex solution there. It has to be elegant. It has to be simple. It has to be reliable, trustworthy. And while all of that, plus it has to be light. So that's the problem that these two things are not making love together. So we figured out the solution. We had uh, separated them, but we had uh, cohabitation. So the best cohabitation solution is multi spool configuration, meaning you will have two or try coaxial shaft meaning you have a one puppy you have another puppy running on top of it then you have another puppy running on top of that so triaxial system now this is a big puppy engine so as you can see the turbine uh, basically the main fan blade is huge it's freaking huge now if this rotates at the core rpm this is gonna fall apart it, the centrifugal force is like lol so what the hell they do again you have the fan you drive it from a very low rpm turbine Okay, you have very low RPM. Then you have medium RPM. Again, this will not do much of air compression. It's basically a fancy fan for cooling the core. So mean compression happens from this puppy. You have intermediate stage. Now that is driven by intermediate stage turbine. Then you have the main core turbine. That's like doing the main bulk thermal energy conversion. So th that puppy has its own RPM. So that red one will be spinning a stupid RPM. It will be intermediate RPM. This will be chill RPM. That's how it does. And ironically, doing it this way actually makes your engine far more responsive. Meaning, if you have all this in one shaft, aerodynamics will not work. Meaning, neither uh, nothing would be efficient. Meaning, uh, this has to be a compromise. This has to be compromised. This has to be compromised. All three would be compromised if they are all running on single shaft. So dual shaft, triple shaft is the easiest way of solving that problem. And the moment you increase your fuel load, uh, the hot gases moves up. But instead of taking time to spool up, it spools up very quickly. Why? Because all it has to spool up is the road, uh, core stage. Once the core stage spools up, that creates even more feedback loop. That feedback loop triggers this part and then it triggers this part. So core will go from, let's say, 10,000 to 20,000. This will go from, so let's say, 7,000 to 14,000. This will go from 3,000 to 6,000. That's how everything works. It's far, very effective, very quick and responsive. If they were making it traditionally, the spool up time would be very long. It's like, it will take time. Like in pilot would like, nitro booster in like, you know, fast and furious. And then plane is like, I hear you, relax, sip some tea. Now it will spool up. So the, ma splitting them makes it very elegant. Now, right now, majority of the planes that you travel in most likely have two. Three is like a Rolls Royce apparently patent, but uh, two you can mostly find everywhere, including fighter jets also. So that's how you do that. Like you split the, you cohabitate them, you split them, and you let them go at the precise RPM they want to be. Like a combustion engineer will tell you, it's like, bro, core needs to be 20,000. Awesome. Air compression engineer will be like, bro, give me seven to 8,000. It's like, awesome. Fan engineer will be like, dude, do not cross 6,000. It's like, okay, done. So you can do that. Now, this all is a hell lot of hassle. Somebody figured out, it's like the core difference is like, core has very t normal jet engine, but the fan is different. So why not make this fan independent and make the core independent? So put a gearbox in between. Of course, not a multi-shift gear, transmission gearbox, just a gearbox. Basically, that will tone down the RPM. So instead of having complicated fan structure that's like, okay, designed for low RPM, it's like, hey, score spins at the RPM that it wants to spin, and then we have a gearbox that tones it down to, let's say, the ratio needed. So it will be like 5 to 1, 6 to 1, whatever have you. 
So that's the gearbox ratio. It was uh, basically Pratt & Whitney introduced this puppy as GTF, gear turbo fan engine. Uh, it was used a lot of, in early days, Indigo Airlines used a lot of this, meaning many Indian people have flown in that, but apparently they had a lot of issues. This was not very reliable. They had ceiling issues and all that jazz. So like a lot of downtime happened because of this. So I'm not sure about the modern fleet. Be mindful, you can have all of them have like say Airbus A320, but they could still have different engines. So this was how it started. And right now only one company, I know that they were selling this gearbox design. Now there is other option that you marry these two also, meaning you have coaxial shafts, two coaxial shafts, and you have hybrid uh, gearbox also. Again, is that viable? In one way or another, yes, but another way, no, because again, complexity directly translates to cost. If you have too much cost, it hurts. So all of these are the solutions that we have right now. Only Rolls-Royce is the one that is trying to do hybrid system at this point in time where it has like, again, that's what I found. Maybe some other company that I have not heard of, but so far gearbox plus uh, two uh, spools configuration, only possible in that. But again, it does, it does not make sense to have uh, basically try, uh, you know, multiple axial and a gearbox. It's like either choose gearbox or choose this. Don't choose both of them. But let's see what happens. This is the current solution that we have right now. Then what we can expect in the future? Well, in the future, we realized very early on, like as in the early development of jet engine, is that if we can separate the RPM, then the engine cowling becomes the next bottleneck. Meaning, uh, this cowling that you see, you can't make that very bigger. Again, it's a big thing. It will start to collide with other things. It will have aerodynamic drag and it will weigh a ton. So fundamentally, there's a very big limitation. So somebody had the idea, it's like, what if the blades come out of the cowling, meaning a propeller basically. So which we classified as unducted fan engine. This is the final form of the technology. Now this was done as early as 80s like 1980s and a lot of R&D was done and two companies like Pratt & Whitney and General Electric, both of them did that and they had final prototypes. They were like, do this, get this validated and we'll start to put it in uh, jets, basically passenger jet and NASA was also helping them. So they were like, why the heck, if they were that ahead, why the heck they stopped? Again, that's why I always say you have basically physics, engineering, economics. Back then, there was oil embargo when this was uh, going on the peak, peak research and development. Oil embargo made it so brutal that every company was like, let's save every single dollar that we can save. But the moment oil embargo ended, the price crashed. Basically, it became free. So at that point in time, why spend hundreds of millions of dollars on researching something if you do not have to need for it? That's why I always say economics is always the main thing. However, all the companies, be it Pratt & Whitney, be it uh, General Electric, they learned a lot from this and not to mention uh, the technology developed for this, for example, like composite wings, uh, basically propeller tips, now is used in GE, GE, GX series engines. So it did help uh, companies learn a lot. And this technology is now making a comeback. Why? Fuel prices went up again. At this point in time, there are two things that are driving research and development in this. Uh, CFM is the next year, they are working on the next gen engine. That's the whole point. That's what they are trying to achieve basically bringing back this. Why? There are two driving factors. First driving factor, fuel prices. Second factor is this also gives them the ability to run it on hydrogen. Now, can they run on hydrogen? Yeah. Will it be practical? No. It's a simple physics fact because again, jet engines are one of those engines that run on max power 24 into 7. Meaning if a plane takes off, goes to your uh, you know, final altitude, it runs at that power for, well, again, could be for 22 hours. Now, generally flights are around 11 to 12 hours, but here's the, you're gonna run out of fuel if you are using hydrogen. Military tried this as early as like 1950s. The megajoule per liter is not there. Hydrogen is the lightest element. Fundamentally, you cannot pack it tight enough. No matter what you do, you cannot, uh, you know, pack it flat out. Like if you have liquid hydrogen, it still does not have enough density. Compare liquid hydrogen's megajoule per liter to, let's say, kerosene's. Kerosene basically RP1 or JP1. You'll find that like exponential differences. There. Now, what people uh, like who is trying to sell you hydrogen, they trick you. It's like per kilogram of hydrogen has more energy than a per kilogram of diesel. That's absolutely true. Factually true. It's just that we don't carry fuel in kilograms. We carry fuel in liters. What is the capacity of tanks measured in? Is it measured in kilograms or ton like it can carry five tons of, you know, you will say this many gallons, this many, this many liters. 
again volume is the limiting factor and you can see that like uh, air airbus or boeing they are building a test engine where they have an engine that is this size and they have tank that is five times larger than that to carry the hydrogen they have like four times time, time, then why they are doing it again if i can find it out if people in 1950s figured it out why the heck they are doing it again they are worried about government if government can just brute force a law it's like we will ban hydrocarbon what the hell you gonna like how other countries are like we are gonna ban like you know this and that it's like dude banning those things will only create worse problem only difference will be you will not see it it will be just like oh instead of pollution being here it's somewhere else and it's like you know replacing one problem with another problem we are not solving the problem to solve the problem we have to go to seaweed biofuel but because a car you know hydrogen is so sexy and because people can't do math it's like hydrogen military tried it the there is one benefit that if you have a hydrogen system you can fly at very high altitude like for u2 kind of planes they were figuring that out that you could have burnout the core could literally run out of oxygen to burn high density fuel so using hydrogen there does make sense it burns very efficiently at even at very low oxygen content so that's awesome but problem was it was creating a trail of water vapor so for a spy plane that's not desirable that you create a trail and not to mention it still had to use normal uh, jet propellant one to take off do everything climb to hyperdrive then use hydrogen for a few seconds and it's going to run out of hydrogen and then land so that's why like hydrogen is in practice like just look at the engine size and a tank size so a lot of companies are working on this sort of unducted fan design at this point in time cfm is the leading at this point in time and general electric is saying they are reviving the system boeing and airbus both of them are one to look into this because this proved like back in the days this proved that we can have very high efficiency meaning more mileage than what we have right now so it's like it's a done deal it's going to happen is question is how long well by 2030s we should have first trial at this point in time So let's see what happens by then. Again, companies are saying it. Let's stretch it to twenty thirty-five. So this is uh, aviation. This was my presentation on ultra high bypass turbofan jet engine. Hopefully you have liked it, learned from it. In that case, please hit the like button, share it among your friends. That will help me a lot. If you didn't like it, didn't enjoy it, I urge you to press dislike, press it twice to show me extra disappointment. Please leave a comment because I do try to reply to all of them. Subscribe, press the bell icon if you're free, and as always, thanks for watching.